Thank you. Do sit down. Um, can I just ask, first of all, are there any kind of real keen film buffs here, people who love going to the cinema? I know David Taylor loves it. But, uh, good, Jamie, fantastic. Well, this one's not just for Jamie. But <laughs> now, at the start of the year, um, there's always that annual excitement uh, in the film industry as the nominations are announced for the Oscars, the annual Academy Awards. And over the kind of the weeks leading up to the ceremony, um, various film critics take it, in their, take it in turns to say why they think one of the particular nominated films should win Best Picture, the most coveted award at the Escorts. Um, and of course, there's always one or two films which are hot favourites. Uh, I don't know if any of you are aware of the list of Oscar nominees uh, for Best Picture this year, but um, it seemed to pretty much be everyone thinking it was going to be Dune or West Side Story or The Power of the Dog. Uh, sometimes there's a bit of a surprise, and there certainly was this year. Uh, there was one film, Coda, which was only nominated for three awards in the whole of the Oscars, and it won every single one of those three awards, including Best Picture. Um, and it was quite notable for being the first what they call streaming service film to win an Oscar. It wasn't on at the cinema, you had to have Apple TV to see it. Um, but you can always be sure that there will be a couple of films in that list of nominees which clearly have no chance of ever winning Best Picture. Uh, impressive films, but you know, they're good, but they're just not that great. Not seen as universally acclaimed, perhaps. Um, <clears throat> and certainly not as impressive as some of the others, which may have had more box office success. Uh, perhaps this year, Nightmare Alley could have been in that particular type of film. Anyone know the film Nightmare Alley? That's why it didn't win Best Picture. Uh, but still, you know, a, a film critic will always dutifully pr produce some puff piece about why they particularly think Nightmare Alley or other uh, unusual films should win. Uh, and it's been tempting as we get to the end of this series, looking at the fruit of the spirit, to have a bit of a, an approach like that. Um, the nine characteristics, or segments as I like to call them, of the fruit of the spirit, um, you know, like the Oscar nominations list, I think there's some heavyweights that everyone knows. Uh, but also, there are others, you could say. Uh, at the start of this series, I did ask a congregation at both of our services if anyone could list uh, the whole of the fruit of the spirit, and, and no one managed it. And not surprising, really. I think we all know some of the big ones who go, yeah, love, joy, peace, patience, goodness niceness or something. Yeah. Uh, you get to things like gentleness and it's often overlooked. It's not one of the kind of well-known parts of the fruit of the spirit. Um, <clears throat> but here I am waving my flag today for gentleness and why it should win best picture at the Oscars or something like that. Um, but of course, I want it. it's, you know, it's not a competition, is it? It's not about choosing the best characteristic of the fruit of the spirit. Each one of these is an essential part of it. Each one of these is evidence of the Holy Spirit at work in us, living in us. God's presence in every part of our daily life. That's why this has been such an important series to do. We need to be displaying each of those characteristics, these virtues in our everyday life. We need to understand how we evidence them in ourselves, how we allow the Holy Spirit to work in our lives. Um, and that's where, when I um, originally wrote a talk uh, based on gentleness a few years ago, I got a bit stuck. How do I evidence gentleness in my daily life? Uh, I remember at the time, Anna Larkin uh, saying to me, yeah, I'm going to be interested to hear what you say, what you have to say about gentleness. This is, it's kind of difficult to know exactly what gentleness is. And I remember thinking at the exact time, yeah, you and me both, Anna, you and me both. Now, how do you do gentleness? I can do love. I can love. I can mostly do patience and self-control. But how do I do gentleness, get it right? I mean, what do you think of when you hear the term gentleness. Often the first thoughts are something a bit wet, soppy, gentle. Something that's the opposite of fierce or strong. Um, and I have to tell you, when I originally thought of it, I thought of these two immediate examples, and it, this does show my age, so apologies if these mean nothing to you. Uh, firstly, when I thought of gentleness, I thought of a care bear. Does anyone here, I know Lindsay's about to put her hand up, have a care bear when they were young? 
Lindsay was deprived, or she's too shy to admit it. Uh, any boys, uh, any guys here out of care about it? No? Okay, fair enough. Uh, secondly, and this, some of you will hopefully know this one, uh, I also thought of Basil Fotherington Thomas, uh, the utterly wet boy from the Molesworth books. Has anyone read any of the Molesworth books? Fantastic, Katie. I will say, uh, someone at um, 9.30 knew all three of the references I'm talking about. Uh, anyway, this is Basil Fotherington Thomas, um, who our main protagonist, Molesworth, describes him. Uh, Skipping like a girly, he is utterly wet and a sissy. He reads chatterbox chiz, and we suspect that he keeps dollies at home. Anyway, his favourite character is little Lord Fauntleroy, and when I say he have a face like a tomato, he reply, I forgive you, Molesworth, for those uncouth words. Wet, sissy, gentle. That's perhaps what we might think of when we try to describe what gentleness is. And I have to say, there's one third thing which also came to my mind, and it was this. I actually thought of Gentle Ben. Uh, does anyone remember the TV series Gentle Ben? Again, must just be sort of if you were born in the mid-70s and you grew up watching it on repeat on no, it's Saturday morning TV in the 80s. Uh, this was actually a TV series in America in the 60s. Um, and it was about this intensely irritating young boy who somehow managed to have a pet grizzly bear and lived in the Everglades in Florida, as you do. Um, and that in itself was not the most remarkable thing about the TV show. Um, what it was was that every week, somehow, this boy and his pet grizzly bear would foil criminals and solve cases that somehow eluded the local police force. Uh, this boy would drag Ben around with him everywhere with this whine of, Bean, come on, Bean, we've got to go. Uh, and by the end of the show, um, it would be Ben who would end up stopping the criminals by getting up on his hind legs and turning from this placid, gentle bear into this fearsome, savage creature that he naturally was. Uh, the poacher or bank robber or escaped convict, whoever the baddie that week was, uh, would understandably be cowering beneath this terrifying animal, scared for their life. And once again, the harmony was restored to the Everglade community. Uh, I have to say, just once I'd have loved Ben to go a bit off script. Uh, you know, the kids going, Bean, Bean, there's some dynamite being stolen from the quarry. Let's go and investigate. And Ben instead refuses, gets up on his hind legs and says, or rather growls, no, I'm sick of this ridiculously hot climate here and this ineffectual police force whose job I always seem to be doing. The salmon are sporing up in um, Alaska and that's where I'm headed for the summer. And then with a sweep of his paw, like smacks the kid away. But of course, Ben didn't ever do that. He was gentle, Ben. He would never hurt that child. And that's actually, believe it or not, quite a good place to start with how we can understand gentleness. Because gentleness is, perhaps from a starting point, perhaps understood, best seen, when demonstrated in contrast to anger. Several years ago, though, uh, there was a poster campaign around Easter time portraying Jesus uh, using the copying, uh, the classic uh, image of the Marxist revolution of Che Guevara. And it had the tagline, meek, mild, as if. Now, it predictably caused some controversy. Um, Jesus was the model of the gentle savior, the kind, compassionate, caring Lord. He wasn't some warrior, and yet the one who told people to turn the other cheek, he wasn't a pushover either. Jesus could be decisive on occasions, knowing when action was required. He didn't placidly sit back and just let, watch the world go by, not interfering or upsetting anyone. But he wasn't a pushover either. He got stuck in. The story that I think illustrates this best is the one that we had read to us when Jesus entered the outer courts of the Jerusalem temple and found that they were full of people selling small animals for the sacrifice required by the ordinary Jews as part of the religious rituals required of them at the time. And this also required a large amount of money changing business because the temple had its own currency and you'd need that to make these purchases of the sacrificial animals. And it was basically a for-profit service. In the original inspiration for the building of the temple, um, this area was supposed to be where the non-Jews could come and pray. And yet instead, it was just turned into this 
profiteering marketplace. And in Jesus' eyes, this wasn't only abusing the focus of the temple, but it was excluding the non-Jews from seeking God. He took action and did so with quite some force. He turned over the tables of money changers. He opened the cages and set the sacrificial birds and animals free. And then with rope used like a whip, he chased out the money lenders out and the merchants, saying, get out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a marketplace? Meek, mild, as if. Gentleness is not about sitting on the sidelines. Sometimes we need to be angry. Jesus, you know, he didn't shuffle into the temple and say, would you please mind awfully not doing that? No, instead he got angry. He said, what are you doing? Stop. This is wrong. This is abhorrent. Get out. And so in seeking how Jesus, this model of kindness, compassion, gentleness, could also be angry, do we actually start to understand more of what it means to display the characteristic of gentleness? It's not about being wet and soppy, but is gentleness simply anger management? Or well, no, of course not. And it's easy to see gentleness when looked at in contrast to anger, but perhaps they're thinking more of the self-control of anger. And of course, that's not what gentleness is. That's self-control, which Stephen's going to be speaking on next week. Gentleness is not a defensive response to our own anger. It is its own, standalone, primary characteristic of having the Holy Spirit in us. Like all the other characteristics, it's something that we need to actively demonstrate in our lives. And we can be gentle whilst being able to take action just as Jesus did. But it's the way we are towards other people, our attitude towards them, that can perhaps be best a demonstration of this virtue. In the other reading that we have from 1 Kings, God appears to Elijah. But in doing so, I think he makes this really important point. Um, the people of Israel were, they pretty much rejected God at that stage. Elijah claims that he's the only one he knows who has remained loyal and faithful to God. And he's like, what do you want me to say? What message of destruction shall I tell them, Lord? He seems to be suggesting. And so God go, tells him to go and wait on the mountain for him and wait for his answer. And there's this great and powerful wind, but God is not in the wind. And there's an earthquake shaking the world, but God is not in the earthquake. And there's this raging fire burning away, and yet God is also not in the fire. God came in a gentle whisper, but followed. And in doing so, he was giving Elijah this powerful metaphor for the answer to what Elijah was seeking. God is the most powerful force that we can know, the most potentially terrifying force in all existence. God can be powerful like a mighty wind or an earthquake or a fire, but he can also be gentle. The people of Israel deserved punishment. They deserved the wind, the earthquake, the fire. And yet God was also able to be gentle with them. Look at me, Elijah saying. I've been good. Not one like all these ungrateful Israelites. A good dose of punishment is what they deserve. And you're right, says God. They do deserve that. But I am the one who decides the punishment. And so we have a glimpse of the future gentleness that would follow. God is gentle with us. There is a gentleness towards us in God's act of salvation. We deserved so much worse for our sin. But what did we get? We got God's grace. We got God's forgiveness by having his son Jesus take our place. Now, I didn't become a Christian because I've been frog marched into a room, shown distressing pictures of Christ crucified, shouted at by a company of angels saying, do you see? Do you understand? You must repent. You have no choice. God did this because he loves you. He loves you. Love him back. No. 
I heard God's message of love, of forgiveness, of grace. My heart wept at sorrow, with sorrow at Christ's suffering, and it wept with joy at his victory over sin and death. We're fragile beings, and ultimately God is gentle with us. In Psalm 103, that Katie read earlier, the writer speaks about this, and he says this, The Lord is merciful and loving, slow to become angry, and full of constant love. He does not keep on rebuking. He is not angry forever. He does not punish us as we deserve, or repay us according to our sins and wrongs. As high as the sky is above the earth, so great is his love for those who honor him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our sins from us. As a father is kind to his children, so the Lord is kind to those who honor him. He knows what we are made of. He remembers that we are dust. As for us, our life is like grass. We grow and flourish like a wild flower. Then the wind blows on it and it is gone. No one sees it again. But for those who honor the Lord, his love lasts forever and his goodness endures for all generations of those who are true to his covenant and who faithfully obey his commands. I can't think of a better description of how God is gentle. God is gentle with us. He could judge us, punish us, have nothing more to do with us, but instead he chooses to love us, forgive us, welcome us. Henry Francis Light in the hymn Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven that we sang at the start of our service, uh, he uses these words. Father-like, he tends and spares us. Well our feeble frame he knows. In his hands he gently bears us, rescues us from all our foes. For God is a good, gentle father, caring for his tender child and children that he loves so much. He doesn't fly off the handle and get angry. He sees us as the fragile, delicate beings that we are. And instead, he is compassionate, kind, forgiving in his gentleness to us. That's what gentleness encompasses, all of those things. Gentleness, being careful with those things and the people around you that are important, that are precious, that are fragile, that are special. When I learned to drive, and this may sound familiar to many of you, uh, the words that I would frequently hear from my dad when I first started were, gently, 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 gently. Um, he wanted me to be careful, gentle, while I was learning to drive in something that was very precious and valuable. How are we to display gentleness in our everyday lives? Where is gentleness in our lives? Uh, well, believe it, or not, uh, believe it or not, I'm actually thinking back to gentle Ben, this powerful, strong, grisly bear who was gentle to those around him. Think of how a lioness carries her young in her jaws. She's so powerful, and yet she gently cares for her young. We must display gentleness in our lives, in how we treat others. As a parent, we may need to ensure we show gentleness when we discipline our children. The same goes for how we react to people in other parts of our lives. In Galatians chapter 6, Paul writes, Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. Gentleness is the embodiment of forgiveness, compassion, kindness. It's a characteristic of the fruit of the Spirit that needs to be actively displayed, not passively. But it's not about being rash or aggressive. When we display the whole of the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, that is when God's glory is seen in this world. And so I'm just going to finish with some words that Jesus spoke, which I think really sum this up. 
He said this. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Amen. Thank you, Tim. Let's pray about some of the things that Tim's brought to our attention.